This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, isn't it about time your printer got smart too? Now printing is smart with HP+. And the HP Smart app is how it all happens. You can print from your phone with just a tap, no matter where you are, even from your garage slash home office slash yoga studio. Huh, that is smart. HP+. Plus. Learn more about smart printing at hp.com slash smart. Okay, everybody, welcome to the latest episode of All Too Real 2. My name is Michael E. Cullen II, and with me, as always, is... Matthew Haas. Matthew Haas. That is my friend, mm-hmm. my co-host, my hetero life mate. Um, the, uh, <laughs> anyway, so today we have an All Too interview with the stand-up comic, actor, and author, Steve Sabo. It was a... Uh, great interview that i did uh the other day with him um he's a great guy he's referred to as the caffeinated voice of reason (laughs) um he's an edgy angry honest and hilarious comic according to his website um (laughs) (laughs) he he besides the year of the pandemic he um he works 52 weeks a year on the road as a comic so Every week of the year, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, No stage is too big or too small for him. You've, uh, you've seen him on, um, he's, he's been doing this for 29 plus years, probably like 30 years now, I guess. Um, he's, uh, had the privilege of sharing the stage with, uh, legends such as Joan Rivers, Chris Rock, Kevin James, Dave Attell, Jim Brewer, Christopher Titus, Tom Green. Um, He's made a television. He's made television appearances on HBO, NBC, E, Comedy Central, um, and he is uh, heard regular uh, regularly on Sirius XM, Satellite Radio, and has appeared on, uh, on whoa on nationally syndicated uh, Sex Talk Live, um, and he has appeared on. Um, hold on. He has uh, made television appearances on HBO, NBC, E, and Comedy Central. He can be heard regularly on Sirius XM Satellite Radio and has appeared on the nationally syndicated Sex Talk Live, um, the BTS radio show, and the Jiggy Jaguar show. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, In addition, he has uh, landed the lead in low-budget horror film Hell's Lake, currently in post-production. He's entertained the troops in um, Iraq and Kuwait, uh, performed at uh, the um, 2007's Gathering of the Juggalos, um, and has uh, been uh, seen nationally and internationally at such festivals as Gilda's Laugh Fest three times, um, Calgary's Funny Fest, uh, the Detroit International Comedy Festival, and uh, Great Plains Comedy Festival. Um, He's performed in... 46 states, seven countries, and four islands. He also wow. filmed the cameo in another uh, full feature length film called Pi Day Die Day, directed by Michael E. Cullen II. It doesn't say that on there, but I'm just wanted to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? Yeah, that, that'd be me. I don't know that guy. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, released theatrically on March 14th of 2016. Um, he, on uh, May of 2017, he was honored to perform at Rock on the Range, the nation's largest rock musical festival, um, headlined by Metallica. Sweet. Yeah. So um, he's an admitted workaholic. It was a great interview that I had with him. Um, he's got uh, he's got a new book out called um, um, How to Fail at Stand Up Comedy, which uh, basically tells you the do's and don'ts of stand up comedy. Um, <laughs> 
from the perspective of a you know touring comic also with some life advice and stuff in there that he um talks to us about uh or me about and um he's also got a he's got a novel um a novel out um he's working on another one um talk a little bit more about that in there um but uh he's a great guy great interview um hopefully you enjoy this so uh stick around and here's my interview now with steve sabo okay uh first off i'd just like to thank uh thank you steve for uh joining us today um how are you doing tonight I'm doing great, man. I'm trying to, I'm trying, trying to adjust my camera so I have less forehead in the picture. Is that weird? Oh, that, that's that, that's fine. I mean, this is just going to be audio, but you're good. <laughs> Was it just the audio? Yeah, oh, good. unfortunately, yeah, because my video is not that good. So, I mean, I don't care. I look ugly, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at myself in the picture, and I go, "Oh, I've got a lot of forehead going on. I should have should have grabbed a hat, but this is great." <laughs> That's why <laughs> I wear one. <laughs> hats yeah. ha- hats are good for that factor. Um, the um, so um, uh, the, the first question I'd like to ask you is like, so you've been doing stand up for a long time. Um, yeah. What uh, what got you interested in comedy? Well, you know, I started doing. Here's the thing. When I was, I figured this out. Is it's weird when you look back on your past, right? But yeah. I always liked comedy as a kid. You know, I always watched the, uh, you know, Johnny Carson when they'd have comics on a, on a Friday night at the very end, and and uh, then HBO when that started coming out, they used to do the uh, the the HBO specials, and then they had the uh, they had the uh, comic relief thing. Yeah. If you, I mean, I, I think I'm uh, I, I'm. I think I'm older than you, so I don't know if you remember that. But uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> here, like on New Year's Eve, they had these little specials and stuff like that, and it was great. And uh, I always liked stand up. And like as a kid, I had uh, um, I had a bunch of comedy cassettes. Like it's really weird, but I had like a cassette of Richard Pryor and, and uh, Eddie Murphy and uh, um, oh, who else did I have? I had um, Andrew Dice Clay and, and and people like that. And where other kids would like we drive down the road on their bikes. You know, with a boombox playing music, I was you know blasting Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor and uh, George Carlin and stuff like that. So I always loved it. But I I, I remembered weirdly um, just a couple of years ago that, and I think it was the third grade. There was a third or fourth grade. There was a talent contest, and I told jokes in between you know the uh, the acts they had. So I guess my very first stand up routine, I was like eight years old, something like that, eight or nine years old. But, uh, yeah, I guess I was always destined to be it. I always liked it, but I never thought I'd actually be a comedian. But I've always, like, kind of been drawn to comedy because, you know, some people, you know, their idols were always sports stars or actors. But my idols were always comedians. I always thought they were great. That's awesome. Um, so uh, so you, you talked about, you know, Murphy and Pryor and Carlin and people like that and Dice Clay. Um, how – who was who would you say is like your biggest influence when you first started doing comedy like the person that you like were drawn to the most yeah that's a really good question when i first started um it's weird because when you when you, when you look back 30 years later you try to figure out that i was i was probably influenced by a, a big group of all of them really yeah but I was nothing. I was. I started off. Believe it or not, when I first started doing comedy, I was an impressionist. So I tried to do, <laughs> uh, which is nothing like what I do now. I don't yeah. do any impressions now. So I'm trying to think if there's anybody back then that maybe even Robin Williams was more of an impressionist, but I wasn't manic like him. Yeah. You know. So I think it was just a combination of, um, gosh, you know, probably a combination of Jay Leno and 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 Jerry Seinfeld and and with the with Sam Kinison thrown in there, you know, <laughs> but. If it was uh, like I didn't really get into Bill Hicks right away, but when I did get into Bill Hicks, I was all into Bill Hicks. Yeah. So he's probably my biggest influence as a as a young comic going up. But um, when I very first started, he wasn't even in the picture at that point in time. Was I did I mean he was, but I didn't really know him. Yeah. I didn't I didn't become aware of him till after he died, which is kind of sad. But yeah. Um, he died yeah. way, way too young. Um, he's he died way he's too young. Probably one of my favorite comics of all time. Um, I'd yeah, say. what was great about him, I thought, was that I, I try to introduce him to people now, and they're like going, well, people aren't even laughing on his CDs. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, that it wasn't all about the laughter back then. You know, he was he was he's making a point. What people don't understand is that because comedy changed so much, back then, 
almost all comedy was all observation. It was all Jerry Seinfeld. So what's the deal with this? What's the deal with that? Have you ever noticed this? Do you ever mm-hmm. notice that? But Bill Hicks was talking about true emotions and 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 real real you know basically real stuff. Real, I don't know if we can curse. But real shit. Oh yeah, you no, know? go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it was revolutionary back then, you know, just yeah. as revolutionary as, 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 uh, as Richard Pryor was, he was revolutionary on, on the white side of it too. It was just completely different. And, uh, people don't recognize that he basically almost single-handedly changed, you know, how people approach stand up. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about stand up too, is, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you do have your observational things, but I really I'm drawn to the people that are like trying to make you think about things. And that's what I think comedy is there for in a lot of ways is to make you think about the world in a different way. Um, Yeah. Yeah. The, um, um, so you've been doing this for how long now have you been doing comedy? Uh, 30 years as of February. So yeah. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. I know it's when you think about that, like I don't, I thought about that. What's what's kind of funny is I uh, uh, this is where I really started thinking about this. I was I was in Vegas um, last year at some point in time, and the, the concierge guy said that he had been you know working there for 15 years. And I, I thought to myself, I go, oh wow, you know this guy's been here for 15 years. He really knows what he's doing. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, I've I've been doing my job twice that long. I, <laughs> You know what I'm doing. Like it's, it didn't even cross my mind how long 30 years really is, but yeah. it's, it's a long time. That's that's crazy. Um, the, uh, I, I know I, I've seen you a couple times, and I mean you're you're hilarious. Um, who, um, you, you tour like all the time. Um, how did the pandemic affect you when it came to comedy? Oh, you know it it, the pandemic sucked really bad because. <laughs> I had this great schedule lined up. Like I, had, you know, if you know about comics, uh, comedy is 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 weird because we're constantly looking for the next gig. So we're trying to constantly book ahead, book ahead, book ahead. And a lot of times you might have a solid schedule for a month, month and a half, maybe up to two months, and then you'll have other bookings sporadically out there. But uh, when two thousand, uh, when two thousand whatever um, hit, you know, even two thousand. My schedule was, was great. I had gigs all the way up until 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 um, you know into, into November. I had gigs all the way booked into November. I had you know solid you know almost a couple of weeks open, but almost completely solid for seven months. And then you know you, you keep hearing about the pandemic, hearing about these things. And this is going to okay, well, they're not going to shut us down. That is not going to really happen. And then it slowly did, like state by state people start closing down. So little by little, I'm losing a gig here then I'm losing a gig here. And then you get a call and going like, well, we're not technically closed, but you know, people are getting paranoid. So we're going to reschedule the show for later. And then that, so it's like, it was like week for week. I had, you know, all these gigs lined up and they were just dropping little by little. It wasn't all at once. It was like little by little, but like I, I, you know, my gigs this week dropped and then my gigs next week dropped and then my gigs the week after that dropped. And it's like, it was just slowly like watching a house of cards just crumble in slow motion. And it was, and it was awful. And, uh, so a lot of comics did, did zoom shows and stuff like that. I think I did, you know, technically one zoom show maybe. Yeah. And, and I hated it. Oh, it was just, it was just awful. It was the weirdest thing because, you know, there's a delay and then you're, and you're waiting for laughter that, that isn't there. Like it's supposed to be there. So your timing is completely off. So then you speed up and then you realize that, that they're not catching on to the jokes anyway. So you're not going to get the laugh. And it's just like everything is just completely thrown off guard. So I ended up um, doing some shows. I would do shows, some weird shows. Like I, I flew out to, to wherever I could just to get stage time. And uh, like I went down to Georgia because they were open. And I went to Colorado, did some uh, parking lot shows, like some, you know, where cars were. We were on the stage and cars pulled up. Yeah, and you're performing at a drive-in in front of all these people, and it was the <laughs> weirdest, weirdest thing. So everything had, had 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 gone strange, and then some places they had you know reduced capacity, so I could do a show, but there's 12 people in a cavernous room, you know, and they're yeah. spread out 20, you know, 30 feet from the stage, and then 20 feet from each other, and it's 
oh, it was very, very strange. So I'm so happy that things are, are, are starting to get back. Most places are back, you know, for the most part now. But now we're in summer, and things slow down naturally for comics in summer. So Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. No, because people want to get out. People want to go out and do things, yeah. you know, because the nice. Yeah, but, they, they want to be inside a club or something. <laughs> exactly. So, But I do have some, yeah. some outside show schedule, and I do have some other things in the work. So, uh, you know, I'm not complaining right now. I'm really not. That's good. Um, so uh, Bob Fredericks on my uh, on my group for this for this page uh, for for this uh, podcast asked about like your first gigs. Like you had to have. He said you had to have brass to do that. Um, like because he is scary. I mean, how scary was it when you first started doing comedy, and where was it that you started? Yeah. So uh, that's good. That's really kind of a good point because when I first started, I was. I was too young to know better, and that's that's probably what helped me. I was 18 yeah. years old when I, when I first did stand up for the very first time. I was at uh, I was going to college at the University of Miami, Florida, and uh, uh, there was a there was a certs college comedy competition, and it was uh, being advertised all over the campus. and And I saw it, and I go, "Oh, that'd be so cool!" And I'm like, "I mean, can I do that? Could I do it? like you know?" I was <laughs> like, "Nah, I'm not going to do that." But then. So it was advertised for weeks and probably, you know, even up to a month or so in advance. And I just never, I kept passing by the flyer every day and I just never signed up and I never signed up. And then on the very last day that you're allowed to sign up, I gave him a call. I said, you know what? I'd hate myself if I didn't, you know, just see fully expecting them to go, sorry, all the spots are filled. We can't get you in, you know, and then I, you know, I'd have that cop out and go, well, I tried, you know, guys like, sure. We'll get you in, and I was like, "Oh crap!" Now, now I've got three days to write a whole routine when everybody else had like a month or more to do this. And uh, so I guess I didn't really have a lot of time, but uh, I was scared to death. Like I was, I was, because uh, I remember all this right, very first time, thirty years ago. I remember this to, to the day. The room was packed, absolutely packed. It's, just, it's called the Rat Skellers, where they performed, and uh, it was a two-story. Um, you know, basically campus bar. So uh, there's a big balcony that swung all the way around. It was kind of like in a circle. And then there was a stage in the middle um, with the bar behind us. And uh, I was number 12 of 15. So I had to watch 11 other people go up before me. And each time somebody new went up, you know, I'm about to pass out because I'm not that afraid. And uh, and I kept saying to myself, like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to leave. I'm going to pretend something happened. I'm going to, you know, lock myself in the bathroom and, and pretend I didn't hear my name getting called. I'm just not going to. So I just kept coming up with every excuse I could possibly get to not do it. But then it was my turn, and I just went. You know, I just took a breath and went, "Whew, okay, I'm going to do it." And and I did. And the first time I did it, uh, like I just walked up and I remember. I remember every second. I like slow motion again like we said of, of when he called my name to walking out to the microphone and it took like forever it took forever to get there and then I don't remember anything about the performance itself but I remember walking up there and then saying good night and then you know I know that I got huge applause and people were laughing and it was great and, I, and all I remember is immediately afterwards going I've got to do this again I've got to do this again and I just, I just, I just, I just, I never felt more alive than I did at that moment. Like I've never done drugs. I'm not a drug guy, but I get, I imagine it kind of feels like what somebody feels, you know, the first time they do drugs. It was just like, everything was brighter. Everything was louder. Everything was more intense. Every, every sensation was amplified. And I just, I was like, man, I, I've got to do this again. And I didn't, I learned so much that day because I didn't know, I didn't know that there was open mics. I didn't know that you, a normal person could just go to a comedy club you know, on an open mic night and sign up and perform in front of people. I thought, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I was, you know, yeah. I was young. I didn't even know comedy clubs existed outside of New York and L.A. I just figured it was like just there, you know. And uh, I learned so much from because other people that were that were performing had done stand up many, many, many times. And I, I didn't even know you could. But uh, I yeah, it was I was probably too dumb to realize how insane it was you know i was too young and dumb to know that doing it was insane and uh but yeah um i did it and fell in love with it and i guess the rest is history i guess <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I, 
took it seriously, though. That's the weird thing is that the first three years I did comedy, I didn't think at all that I was going to be a comedian. But there's this one day I remember I, – I don't remember what club I was in. But I remember I had a great set and I was standing in the back of the club and I said to myself, after about three years, I said, if I did this for the rest of my life, if I could just pay my bills doing this, I didn't I don't have to be rich, I don't have to be famous, but just being allowed, you know, to, to spend my life being on stage and making people laugh, I'll do it for the rest of my life. I don't even care. And I've held on to that. That's awesome. Um I know the the feeling like I've, I've done theater, I've never done stand up, but I mean, I've, I've done a lot of acting and that feeling where you're on stage and you don't remember the actual stage. You remember walking up there and leaving, but you don't remember the actual performance, which is kind of yeah. <laughs> interesting. It's it's weird how that works in your mind, but you know, you it did was- something. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> the um, because I've had that happen numerous times where I've, I've walked off stage and I was like, I don't remember that play at all. I don't. Yeah. Rem- <laughs> You blank. It's almost like a car accident, right? Like yeah. when you have a car accident, you don't remember any part of the accident. You remember before and you remember after, but you don't remember any of the during. Yeah. Um, so, um, what kind of advice? I mean, I know you've got a you've got a new book out. First, we'll talk about that. Like, I'll, I'll bring that up. You know, it's like uh, how to fail at stand up comedy. Is what it's yeah. called. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love the name. Um, so, it um what um. What kind? I, I'm, I'm sure you got some of this in the book, um, but what kind of advice would you give to anybody that's trying to start out like that? You know, like the number one thing that you wish you knew when you started. Right. So that's the that's the big question, right? So there's there never is just one thing that you wish you knew. So I always have like there's always a little mm-hmm. several different things, right? That I uh, that I I pass on to people when they ask me for advice, and it comes down to to it really depends on on what area they're asking about but uh i actually ended up giving this advice to somebody very recently who had a terrible set it was this girl a female comic and and she was doing some outdoor show and uh she had a terrible set and and she immediately thought she's she goes i can't do this you know i'm i shouldn't be doing comedy because i couldn't make these people laugh and what i told her was something that got passed down to me uh you know she almost 25 years ago and they said whenever you have a bad set only take half the blame because, you know, there are other circumstances there that, that created the rest of it. There's the audience, there's the stage, there's the lighting, there's the sound, there's all those different other factors. So you're only half responsible for that. But in that same token, when you have a great set, only take half the credit because all those other factors were involved there as well. And that's the perfect way to stay balanced at all times. That way you never get too big of a head, you know, and you never, you know, get in too big of a depression from having it. So it's, I think it's very important to stay balanced at all time for comedy. Um, I also think that, you know, for somebody who's never done comedy ever in their lives, the best advice I'd give to somebody is go watch a professional show, watch it live, a professional show, and then go to an open mic and watch that live before you ever get up on stage and see the difference and understand, you know, that there are, this is a professional show, this is an amateur show. And there's a very distinct difference. Because there's a lot of people that um, they get into comedy and they've only gone to open mics. They've never seen a live, you know, professional show. They've seen stuff on TV. They've seen the Netflix specials and stuff like that. So they just don't really understand there's a whole different dynamic out there. And they think that just because they can do, you know, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes of comedy, that that makes them a headliner. But it doesn't. A headliner is a very different animal completely. So it's important to know where you actually stand in the world of comedy. And I also think it's important to to go into your first open mic with jokes. And I know that sounds like like an obvious thing, but I, you'd be surprised how many people come up to me and they go, well, I'm just going to go up there and wing it, and I'm going to talk about my day, I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about that. I'm like, you're going to bomb so bad. <laughs> and, right, because you can make your friends laugh when you're sitting in a bar because they're your friends and you're sitting in a bar. But when people pay money to watch you be funny – you know, they don't want to hear about your day. They want to hear something that you put some effort into, some time into, and, and actually have crafted into a joke. And uh, you need to have something, you know, to deliver. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, funny at work or funny at the bar who mm-hmm. probably aren't funny on the stage. You know, it's just the way it is. It's, it's... a completely <laughs> different thing. Yeah, it's completely different. That's the thing that, that a lot of people don't. They just, they just don't understand is they go, but, you know, 
these people look like they're just making it up. I go, yeah, that's the art, you know? <laughs> That's it's. I work really hard to make it look like I'm not working hard at all. That's, yeah, that's the basic line. Yeah. Um. What uh? I'm trying to think. Um. What um. Currently, like, what um, what kind of obstacles do you think there are in the world of stand-up comedy besides the pandemic? Like any other kind of obstacles that are going on. Yeah, one of the biggest problems right now, and you see it in the news all the time, is the, the whole cancel culture thing. The yeah. whole. Uh, the woke situation that we have right now is that audiences, especially at comedy clubs, are getting really nervous um, about about certain material. So they're afraid that you're gonna you're, that you're gonna you know push a button and trigger somebody. But they're also uh, they're just they they're afraid to laugh, and they might think it's hilarious. I've I've, I've done some jokes in, at places before. Where people came up to me after, me, man, I thought that was hilarious, but you know, I couldn't laugh because I was with the boss, or I was with the girlfriend, or I was with these people, and people, you know, they just got this. There's a there's a tension. There's a tension out there right now that says you're not allowed to laugh at certain subjects, and there are some comics that will go forth and they'll they'll do what they can to push those buttons and try, you know, to upset people because they think that's what comedy is. But you can joke about anything and i've always said this a million you know you know all over the place anybody anybody can joke about anything but not everybody can joke about something and make it actually funny you know and that's yeah. the difference is you it takes a certain level of skill it takes a very particular level of skill to be able to do you know edgy material especially nowadays you know particularly edgy material like if you're doing a joke about about transgenders or or you know God forbid, Black Lives Matter or something like that. It better be really, really funny, and it better not, you know, make anybody a victim. So you're not punching down. Yeah. So, you know, it's really tough, you know, navigating that because you can have a joke, like, like let's say you can write a, a, a gay joke, and gay people find it hilarious, but people that aren't gay will be offended for those people. Yeah. And that's the weirdest thing. That's that's kind of a new dynamic. That's just kind of creeped in in the last five years is people being offended for other people. Like they feel like they need to stand up for, you know, everybody else's rights when those people themselves, you know, aren't actually offended. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the, that's a good point you brought, brought up there too, is, I mean, it's the, it's the, you gotta be punching up and not punching down when it comes yeah. to the things. Cause that's, that's where people don't, don't get it. And that's where people make mistakes is if you're, you know, making fun of somebody lower than you, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of being risky. And I mean, I've, I've seen that. I mean, cause that's the, that's the thing where, where when, uh, when I think the difference between a cancel culture and a consequence culture is what I like to call it. Because I think a lot of things, a lot of times is, is that people don't realize that there's consequences for your actions. But I mean, of course, sure. if, if you're being a complete racist or a complete, you know, homophobic person or something like that and punching down on those people, yeah. you, you deserve any kind of backlash you might get. But if you're sure. but but if you're making an observational, you know, comment that's not punching down but punching up or something, that's different than I mean that people don't understand that. And I understand why people are afraid to laugh, you know, because you don't know, you know, especially like you said, if you're with your boss or your girlfriend or your wife or your husband that might be more sensitive about the thing. You never know. <laughs> so. Right. hundred percent. And it's so that, that's why it's always easier when you make your, your your material personal. Make it a be about yourself. Mm -hmm. So because if you're making fun of yourself or or how you view life and things like that, people can't really you know be that offended because it's you, you know, and you're the one saying it. So they can't be mad about that. Like if you're so anything you talk about, you know, if if uh, if you're short or you're tall or you're or, or whatever you are, you know, if you're left-handed, if you do jokes about those particular things, and you are that whatever that dynamic is, then people can laugh along with you. But like if you're say um, six foot four, and you're making jokes about guys that are five foot two. You know that's that's probably not you know going to work out very well for you. Yeah, it's like um, I remember a quote from like the director Kevin Smith where he was talking about the fact that people tried to say that he was making gay jokes in his films, but the real what he pointed out is that Jay was the one saying those, and he's the stupid one in the movie. And what he was trying to point out is the fact that making those jokes 
is the stupid thing. So you got it's all about context, you know. It's just <laughs> right, absolutely, and and mm-hmm. and that's that's what I call layering when it comes to a joke, right? Is yeah. that it's don't look at the joke on the surface because it's not always that's not necessarily what the joke is. The joke might be that you're actually making fun of a person who would make that joke, just like you know yeah. Kevin Smith made that. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a tricky situation nowadays. I mean, you do have, you know, it, pe- people people are more offended now. But, you know, I I understand it. And plus, we've got a more social network kind of culture where it's like yeah. you can easily react to things easily. People with their cell phones in a comedy club or wherever, you know, you it can easily destroy a career. But Yeah. yeah. And I read somewhere that it's only like 2% of people on Twitter that 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 it cause all the uproar, you know, that 98% yeah. of people don't do anything, but that 2%, that vocal 2% that can destroy careers. That's, that's just, it's crazy to think about that. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always a, you know, cause like, it's like when you, uh, when you go to a restaurant and you have good service, you don't usually go on to Yelp or something and talk about how great your service was. But if you have bad yeah. service, you will go on Yelp and talk about how horrible it was. Yeah. You know, <laughs> That's the truth. Back in the day with comedy clubs, this is the funniest thing, is comedy clubs used to have uh, comic cards that they'd leave on the tables, and people would fill out the comic cards. And the crazy part was you could have 100 comic cards that said, we love that guy. He's the best guy. Keep bringing him back. But you have two comic cards that say, we hate him, and you might not be booked back just because of those two cards. And it's it's kind of the same way with Twitter right now. You know, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's also the thing, you know, you can do that to yourself, too. Like, if you read read those comments, you know, everybody else, like, 90 people could say you're great, but there's those two people that say you're horrible. You're probably going to remember those two and not the, you know, 90 people. There's nothing can be more true. When you're on stage and you can have a room full of people, 200 people in the audience, 300 people in the audience, and everybody's laughing except for table seven. You will always see table seven, no matter where you are, where you're looking. <laughs> Ripple is zoomed in on table seven, and your brain's going, "Why are they not laughing? What did they? What did I do to them? Why are they mad at me? What don't I? Why don't they? La-? I'm going to get them with the next joke. Something. I'm going to find out what's going to make those people laugh, and you just end up being focused just on that one table of people that don't like you, and they may have actually really liked you, but they just don't, you know, express it the same way other people do. Yeah. It's a crazy thing. Um. About your book too. What 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 brought you to wanting to write the book? Like what uh what was the the you know catalyst for that? It's a really good question. So um, I guess there's a there's a there's a multitude of, of 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 reasons. So one of the reasons is you know the pandemic hit and uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. And the first thing I did is um because I didn't want to be idle and you know that's the last thing you want to do and it's I wasn't having a good time, you know, coming up with a lot of jokes to write because most of my jokes come from living life and, and doing things. And I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing anything. And it, there's not a lot of jokes you can write about, you know, you can write a hundred jokes about there's a toilet paper shortage, but that's, you know, yeah, everybody's heard of it. Everybody's living the same experience at that point. So what I ended up doing first was I, I wrote my first novel. I wrote that it's called Jester's Run and that's also available um, on awesome. Amazon. And because uh, I had an idea in my head for about 10 years of a, of a story I wanted to write. And uh, but I never had time because I'm always on the road. I'm always traveling. And when I'm home, you know, I barely have time to do laundry and, you know, and get back on the road. So um, but I had time and I wrote the novel. and I was super you know, excited about it. But um, I also then I had you know, finished that. But it, even between drafts, I had to write something else because you can't just focus on just that one thing. And comedy is what I know. And I always thought to myself, because there are times where people had asked me to teach comedy classes, and I didn't want to teach a comedy class because every comedy class always ends up being the same. Every comedy class is, you know, here's what you do. You take the microphone, put it out of the stand, obey the light, you know, all these different types of things. Very simple ideas that anybody could teach, really. any You don't have to – you can be a comedian for two years and teach somebody else to be, you know, a comedian because the basics are all the same. You can teach somebody to be a comedian, but you can't teach somebody to be funny. And that's there's a big difference between those two points. You know, yeah. you can tell somebody, you know, where to look and give them all kinds of hints and, and how to write and these kind of things. But it, it doesn't teach you um, the things that you can only learn from being on stage. Those are that's what, you know, comedy really is about being on stage. You can have somebody like that's why some people will do comedy for 10 years or 20 years and still be in, this, in pretty much the same position they've always been at. 
because they just don't have it in them. They just it just doesn't click with them. But for most people, it takes a few years. But 100 times on stage, 150 times on stage, 200 times on stage, and suddenly, you know, little by little, you know, little nuances, you get better, you get better, and you get better. Um, but I always thought to myself that there are so many things that they don't teach you in these comedy classes that they really need to teach you. And, and it's mostly life things, right? But they'll teach you things like how, you know, if you're going to make a living at comedy, you have to go on the road. And going on the road is incredibly hard to do. And you can't just say, I'm going to go on the road because, you know, you have to be, you have to be ready to go on the road, right? You have to, uh, you have to have a good car. You have to, you know, um, you know, how it's just, there's just so many dynamics to it, right? To, to travel. Yeah. And you have to book yourself out because that's one of the things I, I tell people. And I talk about this in the book a little bit too, is that when I first decided to be a professional comedian, one of the things I did was I booked 12 straight weeks of work and I quit my day job. And, uh, then I had 12 straight weeks of work and that was it. I had nothing else after that because <laughs> once I booked 12 weeks, you know, I thought that it was just going to keep going on its own, but it doesn't go on its own. It's a constantly moving, flowing process of booking more shows and auditioning for more people and doing these kind of things. And it's all these things that you're going to need because one of the problems that people don't even understand also is that um, you – let's say you live in Chicago and your show might work in Chicago, but that show that works in Chicago might not work in small town Georgia. Or it might not work in Boston or it might not work in, you know, wherever else. Yeah. So you have to figure out a way to be universal with your act and not, you know, locational, not just something that, that's only regional that works for certain people. So you got to learn how to do that and you got to learn how to um, to organize your time. And like like you have a gig that's two hours away. You can't leave two hours before that gig to get there. You have to leave four hours before that gig to get there because you never know what's going to happen. There could be traffic. You know, you know, there could be an accident. There could be um, road closures. There's construction. There's a million different other factors that come in there that a lot of people they don't think of, and it could be a time change. That happens a lot too that people don't don't consider when they're when they're booking things and, and things like that. And you have to have enough money to get from point A to point B, and and you might be paid by a check, and you might not have cash to get home, and and you know, there's, there's so many different factors. So I thought, you know, nobody's ever written a book about what it's actually like to be a comic, um, because the books that you see are either here's a how to to be a comic book, you know, how to be a stand up, or it's a book by somebody famous, you know, like Kevin Hart, where he talks about his life, but he's not living the life of a normal comic. He's not living the life of somebody who's been doing comedy for three, four, five, ten years. Yeah. There needs to be a book out there that tells people things like that. Things like uh, um, basic things, like uh, don't get hammered on stage. You know? Don't get completely drunk. Don't don't try to fuck the wait staff. You know, that's the important. <laughs> you know, they, they, people don't, they don't, they don't think about, they think that, Oh, I'm a star. This, I, this is part of the gig. It's not part of the gig. You're, you're not supposed to do that. That's, that's going to get you not booked back. That's how that works. You know, um, about having different videos that you can send out to comics about how, uh, one of the things that people need to understand is that you're going to contact a hundred bookers and you're going to have a hundred bookers ignore you completely. And, uh, and it's a lot more than being funny and it's a lot more than being available. It's, it's a combination of things. It's, it's about who you know and knowing the secrets of how to, to actually get your foot in the door. And, and that's what none of these books teach you until this book. This is the first book I've ever seen. And I only wrote it because I thought there was a huge gap in there missing about how people can, can actually, um, be successful as a comedian. So I called it how to fail at stand-up comedy for the simple reason of it's a book about all the mistakes I've made in my 30 year career and how I overcome them and what it takes to, uh, to be a survivor and be successful. And I, I think I've, I've, well, I think I've made it so far anyway. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do like the, I like the title. I mean, I, one of my, one of my favorite screenwriting books is called, um, how not to write a screenplay. So it's kind of a similar, <laughs> similar concept, which I, I love that idea. So <laughs> for sure, you need to know uh, what not to do in order to do the right things, right. You yeah. know, and I, I think that's really important because I think when you see this people doing the exact same thing, like here's an example, right? Something I would tell people not to do. 
is if you're if you're a stand-up comic, don't wear a black hoodie on stage, you know, and carry your notebook with you because I don't know, 98% of comics do that, you know? So you just look at, like exactly everybody else that's yeah. out there doing that thing. You want to stand out, not blend in when it comes to something like that. So have something more unique to you. Don't just, oh, these people are dressed like this, then I need to dress like this. That's not really how it works. You need to be, you know, a little bit different than that. Yeah, you got to have your own uh, your own hook or something, you know, that'll make people remember you. I mean, it doesn't have to be something crazy, but something at least that's memorable. Yeah, just just something, you know. Wear wear a nice shirt, you know. Shave before you go up on stage. Is that <laughs> too much to ask? You know, shower. I mean, that's an idea. You know? <laughs> don't look homeless. I don't know. It's, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, uh, I I I love it when there's a you know a comic who you can tell has their own unique like there's a there's something about them. Sometimes you can't even put your finger on it, but that makes them memorable. Like you won't forget that because I watch a lot of stand up comedy and I couldn't name half the people that I've seen. Right. But right. there are those ones that stand out that I, you know, remember. And that's the ones I like, you know, the best. Yeah. And, uh, uh, the French call that je ne sais quoi, yes. right? <laughs> a, a certain something. And it's, uh, and, and it's true, right? There's a, there's a, there's some sort of a, a magnetism that draws you to them. And you don't even know why, but you are compelled to watch them. And you, you were just, you're, you're riveted. You're stuck there watching them. And other people, you just, eh, they could be the funniest pe- people in the world, theoretically. You know, the jokes could be really good, but you could walk away and go, eh, you know, eh. It just doesn't sit with you, you know? Speaking of which, uh, of like the comics that are working right now, who are some of your favorites that you've seen? So my favorite comic, I think, uh, if you're talking like, you know, big name comics that people would know, uh, by far is Bill Burr. I yeah. love Bill Burr. I yeah. think he, uh, I don't know, uh, I've, I've always liked Bill Burr, but he's just gotten better and better as, as the years have gone on. And he just, his, his ability to be, uh, both edgy and honest and personal at the same time, mm-hmm. he gets away with so much stuff that most comics can't. And that's the thing that I would encourage people to, to look at people like that and go, why why does it work for him you know what is he doing right what is he doing right whatever it is he's really doing it right so i really like him um i haven't seen him in a in a couple of years but i i uh anthony jeselnik i i love his joke writing style he's just got a great way of of writing a joke that uh that takes a left turn out of nowhere and yeah. i just think that <laughs> as far as you know there it's dark and it's it's and it's demented but as far as just structurally how to write a good joke that's somebody you should you know really pay attention to and uh i really like i still like jim jeffries you know uh mm-hmm. i didn't love his last special as much as i i usually like him but yeah. uh i think he's really good too yeah his last one wasn't as good as like freedom that was that one was, right that one was really good i mean i think that's his best probably and the alcohol cost even back in the day is just like oh my gosh <laughs> it's, so, it's so you know it, so many laughs yeah yeah um <clears throat> what was uh, the the novel you wrote? What's that about? Just curious. So, Jester's, yeah, Jester's Run is about a uh, it's basically about a stand up comedian because you write about what you know, right? Mm-hmm. About a stand up comedian who hooks up with the wrong girl, uh, ends up catching a horrible disease. It is not an autobiography, just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, catches up with a horrible disease, uh, almost starts a brand new pandemic. And he gets chased down by some government agents, and um, it's basically, it's a it's a thriller, and I don't want to. It's hard to even explain without you know, uh, without telling you much. But it's uh it's about uh it's about a stand up comedian you know trying to do his thing, meanwhile, uh, trying to keep away from from government agents who are trying to basically, he thinks they're trying to kill him, when they're really just trying to cure him in the long run. And uh, it's got a lot of a lot of turns, a lot of twists, a lot of turns, a lot of uh, a lot of comedy, but it also it's action and adventure. It's I think it's a I, you know honestly obviously um, I love it because I wrote it, yeah. but um, I really I've gotten a lot of really good feedback off of it, and uh, I think if nothing else, it really stands on its own just because there's not a lot of books out there about stand up comics as a character, you yeah. know, in, in lifestyle. So you really kind of uh, it's a unique 
kind of point of view as far as uh, uh, as far as a thriller goes. And and a lot of people have really told me they, that they really liked that they didn't see where it was going. You know, it's it wasn't just you know a lot of times you turn on a TV show nowadays and you know five minutes in you know how it's going to end. Yeah, and uh, you won't get that with this book, and that's why it's really great. That's awesome. I'll have to check that one out too because that sounds that sounds interesting. It sounds like it would almost, almost make a good movie or something. Just the basic. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have said to me they said that when they watched it uh, or when they watched when they read it. They felt like they were watching a movie in their mind, you know, and that's that's kind of how I wrote it. I wrote it with uh, with short chapters, uh, with a lot of action, with a lot of cliffhangers. It's one of those things where where you're reading it and you get to the end of the chapter and you go, and you go I got to start the next chapter. I got to read the next chapter. I got to get to the next chapter and before you know, um, it's done. And I, that's what I wanted. I wanted it to be a book that you could pick up and read on an airplane or pick up on a beach and you wouldn't want to put down. That's cool. Um, speaking of acting and stuff, you, I mean movies. You've done a little bit of acting. I know you were in a. You're in a movie I directed called Pi Day Die Day, and I know you've been in other things. Um, what? Uh, I was killed in the first act. Yeah, you're the. I think you were the first person killed in the movie. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was, I was a yoga instructor. I was. I was informed by some people that my that my stance was terrible in yoga. <laughs> in yoga. Well, yeah. Well, well, that, that that's more reason for you to be killed. Um, <laughs> the um. So. so um. What um what else have you been doing acting wise? How, how have you liked that so far? The little bit that you've done here. Yeah, I uh, acting is fun. I haven't done a lot lately, yeah. but um, I enjoy acting. It's just, it's a different dynamic. The problem I have with acting, and I do, and I do like it. I do, but especially when you're acting on TV or film, is that you don't get to see uh, how it really came out until months and months or, or years later, and that is the complete difference with stand up. Yeah. Like I love the immediate reaction of stand up and uh and that's what's great like even like for a book that's it's torturous for me for that because it takes you 6 months or a year to write a book and then you put it out there and you wait for people to read it and get <laughs> feedback and then if they don't like it you just wasted a year of your life you know <laughs> that's the same thing with the movie or or a TV show and stuff like that where with stand up if you write a joke and it doesn't work you can you know try that joke again the next day or at least the next week and figure out how to make it you know work so i love the immediacy of stand up more than anything else but i i do enjoy um i do enjoy acting i like uh playing off other people you know and having uh it's more where it's not just you that's the thing about stand up is that it's everything 100% of it is is just you it's it's your words it's you on stage and it's and you you wrote it you performed it you know where uh acting is is more um, uh, I'm, uh, there's a word I'm, I can't find in collaborative. My head. Collaborative. There Good. Go. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. That's what I always think of film. Film is like the most collaborative media that's out there. I think you know film and TV because sure. it's just you know because you know, like you said with stand up you're you're yourself you know unless you're like a duo but you know you gotta <laughs> right. but but you know that's basically what it is or or like you know and any other thing you know it's like you're basically just worried about yourself you're not worried about everybody else but with filmmaking you know it's really hard you got to worry about every single person involved that which is why it's sometimes hard to do <laughs> yeah well for sure because you got yeah. you get a writer you got a director you got the, you have the actors and you know you have lighting you have sound and there's there's a million things that can go wrong and somebody has to to coordinate all of that and that's tough and like you said you never know what the result is until you know months or years later and you're just like it could just totally suck you know you're just like wow i wasted a whole year of my life you know like you said with your book you know making a yeah. movie and it's like okay yeah nobody likes it um the, the um the it, it happens um the uh so um speaking of like movies and stuff like that because the topic of our podcast is like um fil films and and uh, pop culture and stuff what uh what would you say I, there's something a weird question i like to ask people what's a guilty pleasure movie that you like to watch that you sometimes don't like to admit that you like to watch Oh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. So I like. I, it's going to be one of those things that it's going to be kind of weird. I like uh, horror movies. I've always really liked horror movies. Yeah. And certain ones that you know I really you know have an affinity for. Uh, and one of those is is a movie called Pumpkinhead. I don't know okay. if you've ever heard of that. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that movie is 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 so is so good. Just. Because it's 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 more than than you know. First off, Lance Henriksen is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, starring in that role, like he's he is a, uh, 
a very underrated actor. He's done other things that he's been really great in, but I think he's particularly good in that movie. And um, and it, it, it's again, it's one of those movies that you can look at it just on the surface as you know, kids, you know, you know, cause some trouble and then they get you know, you know, slowly killed off by this creature thing. But it's it's more about that. It's about vengeance. It's about it's about uh, a father's love for his son. It's it's such a great movie. But on that other sense, uh, as far as horror movies go, I really love uh, a movie called Reanimator, which I thought was really great, um, and a movie called uh, Frankenhooker, <laughs> and both because they're so cheesy and so you know just overall silly in the, as far as that genre goes. Yeah, and it's so fun to watch. You just can't you know. You can't not enjoy it. I mean, I guess you can. There's people that, yeah. <laughs> that like it all. But for someone like me, it's just like, oh, it's so over the top that it's just fantastic. Yeah, those are fun movies. Um, I, uh, yeah, the, the the cheesy horror movies are always great. Um, the um, what um, where can people find you before I be, be, before we wrap things up here? Like, where's the like where can people find your uh, work and um, and uh, yeah. get a hold of you? So uh, I do have my own website, stevesabo.com, S-T-E-V-E-S-A-B-O.com. I'm also on uh, Facebook uh, and uh, in MySpace still. I mean, I, I actually, I'm i not even on MySpace, but I still have a MySpace account. Yeah. I, uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. Uh, always when you just uh, make sure you do comedian Steve Sabo because there's other Steve Sabos that are out there yeah. that have done things. One of them happens to be a, a very well-known and popular gay male model, which is uh, kind of funny uh, because he – and I, I joke about this, but it's really true. If you, if you Google image search me, um, the first five or six pictures will be Steve Sabo, me, the comedian. But the next five or six pictures will be of this young, buff, shirtless dude, you know, that uh, – who's uh, – you know – I, I'm straight, but I'll say he's dreamy. You know what I mean? He's a, he's yeah. a good looking dude. Great shape. So uh, there's been more than a few women that, that went to my show expecting that guy to appear on stage. <laughs> and, and I <laughs> Very disappointing for them under those circumstances. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm out there. Yeah, I'm, uh, obviously I got, um, I'm on Pandora. I'm on Rhapsody. I have, uh, in fact, I was one of the very first comedians to have a Pandora station, which is weird. Um, <laughs> but I don't even know why, but I was. I was one of the very first few. And um, so you can l- listen to all my stuff out there. I'm on uh, Sirius Satellite Radio. I'm out there. You just Google my name, Steve Sabo, in, co- in comedy or comedian, you'll find me. But definitely at, at my website, stevesabo.com. Yeah. We'll put some uh, links in the show notes, too, so people can find you. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, anything else before we let you go here tonight? I don't know. I uh, I want you know this thing is about my book. About let's talk about the book for a second, and I'll say yeah. that the, the How to Build Stand Up Comedy book is uh, just to let people know that it's not just about um, how to be a comedian or how not to be a comedian in that sense. It's a uh, it's got a lot of life lessons, a lot of things that are in there. Because I know some people that have read it that had no interest in comedy, but they were they enjoyed the fact that there's a lot of uh, anecdotes and and it's partly I always this is what I say it's it's a part instruction manual, part memoir. And uh, in a, a part cautionary tale, because uh, <laughs> you know there's a there's a lot in there that's very personal toward me. So you can learn all about you know what it's like to be a comedian from the inside. Something that people don't really get to see a lot of, mm-hmm. but it's also you know, can help you as a person, um, you know, in any part of your life. It really it's it's all about um, the mistakes that you can make in any career that you're doing, and and what you're doing wrong, and how you can fix that kind of stuff. So um, it's kind of like a uh, in, in a way, it's partially a motivational book, I guess, in that sense yeah. as well. So there's a lot of good parts to it there. And I also want to tell people to uh, to, uh, to to keep track of me and look out because I'm I'm working on my uh, my next novel right now. So my new novel will be coming out uh, hopefully in October. So to to look for that as well. And uh, I believe it's going to be called uh, Kayla's Gone. It's another it's another thriller. But uh, hopefully the title doesn't change between now and then, and people are looking for that, and it's not there. But uh, um, that's going to be a fun book. That's about a uh, well, I say it's a fun book. It's not really a fun book. It's about a it's about a girl that goes missing and uh, a mother's um, search for her daughter and, and how she finds out about uh, the secret life that her daughter's been leading 
you know, up to that point. So it's a, it's definitely a departure. There's no comedy in it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's got some funny parts. There's a, you know, I'm a naturally, you know, this natural comedy in what I write, you know, yeah. but, uh, it's, but the, there's no comedian, you know, as a, as a character and, uh, uh, it's just a straight, uh, straight up thriller, but I think it's got funny, uh, funny moments. It's got action. It's got adventure again. And, and again, hopefully a lot of twists and turns and surprises that people don't expect. Awesome. I can't wait to find time to read all of these books actually. Cause I, yeah, I really want to, they all sound great. Um, the, the, and, yeah. um, yeah, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you're, you can be the next, uh, Tony Robbins with the motivational stuff and stuff too. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a different approach to motivation, you know, yeah. but, uh, um, it's it, look at this. The reason I approached it in the way I did is, is this, it's like, I'm not telling you, um, to do anything that I don't do myself. I made these mistakes, you yeah. know, I did almost everything that's in those books, almost everything, not everything, but a lot of things I tell people not to do. I'm telling you because I did it, you know, <laughs> I, I, I did it and it screwed up my career. It made, I made a lot of mistakes. Like, like one of the things I, that's important in there is that, uh, when I first started doing comedy, I wanted to make it on my own. I wanted to be, you know, I, I didn't want anybody, you know, to help me out. And that was the, dumbest thing I could have ever done in my life because the fact of the matter is is you can't get anywhere without friends you can't get anywhere in life without somebody giving you a chance and giving you an opportunity and I was uh I was too dumb to realize I guess dumb isn't even the right word I was I, I had too big of an ego right I had I was too uh you know whatever you want to call it just uh I had too much of a chip on my shoulder to realize that if to 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 be successful somewhere along the line somebody's gonna you know to give you the helping hand and you should yeah take the opportunity that you have and i i didn't when i should have uh, you got you know sometimes the biggest mistake you make is the thing you don't do as opposed to the thing you do do so you know <laughs> yeah. that's 100 percent right yeah well uh thank you for your time and if you do ever want to come back on and talk about your future books or any of your stand-up or anything like that just let us know um we're always open to having you on and uh, that sounds great. yeah and um hope you have a good night and uh talk to you soon thank you buddy appreciate it thanks okay uh hope you enjoyed that uh interview there that we did with uh steve sabo um great advice there got a lot of uh a lot, a lot of good stories and everything that we could uh help us learn from uh the life of a stand-up comic for three decades you know yeah you don't really get a chance to talk to people like that that often um hopefully everybody checks out his book um how to fail at stand-up comedy which uh hmm. i hope to buy soon um yeah really, me too yeah i think you'd probably enjoy it matt i mean it's gonna have a lot of good life advice in there and stuff too he said for <clears throat> anybody of any walk of life yeah, I mean, because like, especially when it comes to like creative types, it's good to, you know, hear what, you know, a veteran has to say about, you know, balancing, you know, your creative life with, you know, other parts of your life, you know, and um, because like, you know, like I said before, it's like I've been wanting to read books by comics for a while, like um, one of the ones like Michael J. Fox wrote a few years ago, and I, I always forget to, but. Yeah. I think I'm going to finally get into it and just sort of, not just for the funny parts, but just to like learn more about like their personal lives, like how, yeah. how do they balance this out, you know, because that's, it, being creative is fine and everything, but if you don't, you know, if you can't have like a family or any kind of like friend circle, you know, it's, it can get kind of lonely, you know? Yeah, you have to see what it is, <clears throat> see the things that, you know, there, there's pitfalls you can learn in life, you know, from, from people, even people that are in different careers than you. Um, and I think that'd be good. Um, also I really want to check out his, uh, the thriller that he wrote called Jester's Run, which sounds really cool about a, uh, about a stand up comic on the run during, during some interesting situations that he talked about in the interview. <laughs> um, so that sounds really cool. I'd like to see that turned into a movie someday, almost, the uh, basic idea mm -hmm. that he had it would kind of it sounds like it'd be a good movie i told him that um anyways um any uh any other thoughts on your mind here matt before we wrap things up no i don't think so okay um well people um if you have any other uh, suggestions for any other guests or anything that you want to 
have us on ha, have us have on the show or if you want to be a guest on the show um we'd be more than happy to talk to you if you have something to promote or talk about um message me at mike at cullenpark.com and we can set that up um you can also find us at all too real two podcast group on facebook um all too real com is a good place for links to our, our like twits and books and <laughs> grams and all those other social media mm. stuff you know and uh, link to all of our previous episodes you can listen to our reviews of uh recently of um the michael richards show and uh <laughs> our um interviews with other people like uh mark christopher lawrence recently another stand-up comic um you know so if you liked this episode um check us out i i'd appreciate that um also um you know now that things are kind of you know calming down from the pandemic uh just suggestion to people you know when you're going out there in public be kind to each other you know we're all going through this thing together and uh you know remember how to act out in public you know because you might have been in your apartment or house for a long time now and don't remember how to treat a waiter or waitress or somebody (laughs) like that you know just be nice to people you know it's we're all humans you know don't get so angry at the little things in life um i think that's always a good way to live you know it's just it's hard advice to live by i don't always live by it but you know it's just you know smile be happy do it yeah um you know be kind you know (laughs) and when you're going outside make sure you wear some sunscreen yeah you know it's good advice always wear sunscreen and you know wear a condom when you're outside yes yeah. What? No, no, no. That doesn't sound oh, okay. right. No, no, oh, okay. no, no. Oh, no, that's bad. Okay. Sorry. I've been wearing this one for like 43 years now, so I don't know. <laughs> Should I take it off now? Uh, I don't even want to ask of how <laughs> you're able to do certain things while wearing that the whole time. <laughs> All right, I'm joking. I haven't been. Um, anyways, okay. so, uh, but but anyways, people, be kind. Rewind. Look at look at life in a good way, and uh, yeah, be good to each other. Until next time. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to All Too Real Two podcast, a Cullen Park production, produced and edited by Michael E. Cullen the Second. Music by Matthew Hawes. Subscribe and share the show. Visit us at CullenPark.com.